everyone here this morning. Uh, today we're going to jump into uh, the second denomination that we're talking about. We talked about Eastern Orthodoxy the last three weeks. So we're jumping into the next one, historically speaking, and that is Roman Catholicism. Um, and uh, today we're just going to have a brief kind of historical uh, a look at them, just kind of like we did with Eastern Orthodoxy, and then next week uh, and uh, most probably the, the week after, we'll look at their doctrinal distinctives, um, which can be a little bit uh, more tricky, actually, than the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church in their variation of it. But uh, uh, let me go ahead and say a word of prayer for us, and we'll get started. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time that we can be together. I pray uh, that you would uh, be with us. Um, despite uh, what is going on in the world, Lord, you are with us, and you are gathering your people um, from all over uh, this nation, from all over this world, Lord, to uh, be your people, be your sons that uh, will uh, worship you in truth and in spirit, Lord. And I pray that uh, that would give us strength and that we would recognize that the Christian's hope can never fail, Lord. Uh, for our hope is in you, Christ Jesus, who has accomplished uh, everything uh, on his work here on earth and on the cross, Lord, and in his resurrection. And we thank you so much for him. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, I do have someone uh, would uh, like to read a scripture passage for us this morning. If, could someone read um, Mark chapter 7 and read, um, if you would, starting in verse 6 and read all the way down to verse 13 for us this morning. That will set a context here for us. Matthew, or Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 6. Yeah. Mark 7, 6 to 13. 6 to 13, yeah. And he said to them, Lord, did I say it's prophesied that you hypocrites are really good? These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they will worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. To read the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man kills his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is forfeit, that is given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything towards father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And may such things be good. Thank you. Yes. So this uh, passage is, of course, referring to the Pharisees. This is Jesus uh, speaking directly to the Pharisees in the book of Mark, um, talking about many of the different rabbinical traditions that uh, had cropped up over the years, and the Pharisees were. Uh, advocating for these traditions, saying that these were from the fathers, and yet Christ was showing just very clearly how their tradition had overstepped the word of God and was going directly against the commandments of God. Um, and the reason I bring that up is, of course, <clears throat> a big part of Roman Catholicism and uh, uh, its belief system is tradition. We talked about this in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but the Roman Catholics are going to do this uh, on steroids, basically. We're going to even go further into um, tradition being held over and against Scripture um, and really going against uh, many of the commandments of, um, of God. Uh, of course, uh, this is something that is uh, much more uh, near uh, and dear to the hearts of, of Protestants, being that we were forged in a debate directly with the Roman Catholic Church. That's why the Eastern Orthodox Church normally goes unnoticed. Um, but uh, so whenever we look at these doctrinal distinctives, especially once we jump into next week and see, uh, see them kind of categorized for us, you'll see just how uh, they are defined basically over and against exactly what we believe the scriptures are teaching. Um, and much of that has to do with the fact that uh, modern Roman, or at least uh, much of what modern Roman Catholicism is and much of what modern reform teaching is was forged in a debate over what the scriptures are saying, except that the reformers said, no, only the scriptures can interpret the scriptures. And so the Catholics had to double down and say, no, only the church can interpret the scriptures. And, um, and so this, of course, had uh, many different aspects of the debate were then uh, forged and solidified uh, for centuries to come. 
Uh, so where does Roman Catholicism start? Well, that's kind of a hard question to answer, just like the Eastern Orthodox Church. They're going to gl claim that they started, of course, in 33 <laughs> AD. Um, which, of course, uh, funnily enough, we're going to see that that's not even uh, unique to Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Many Protestant churches will try to claim uh, the same thing as well. Um, and uh, But that's a, for a whole different uh, ballgame, of course, since they have to uh, start to talk about what the Protestant Reformation was about and, and how uh, the starting of different churches at that time uh, took place. But Roman Catholicism, um, of course, their, their, their claim that they started in 33 AD is unfortunately just as erroneous as the Eastern Orthodox uh, claim to the same, uh, because there is a claim here uh, inherently in that claim uh, that may go unnoticed, but the claim has to be then that there has been little to no change uh, in doctrine um, or belief since 33 AD, and unfortunately, just like the Eastern Orthodox Church, and even more so in the Roman Catholic Church, there has been change over time and development, and that development has, uh, in, in our opinion, gone very far afield from what the scriptures actually taught or what the apostles actually taught. And so um, we'll kind of see how that uh, goes forward historically. Uh, Roman Catholicism, of course, um, was already, we already started to talk about this in our historical talk of the Eastern Orthodox Church, um, because once we get to 1054, some of those distinctives in the Roman Catholic Church uh, are starting to creep up, and that was what was the uh, kind of distinctive against the East, right? Uh, one of the big ones in that time was uh, the papal claims, right? The Pope is beginning to ascribe more power to himself, um, and, and he, he did so. It wasn't just his own... Uh, idea that uh, it came, it wasn't just one man being selfish, uh, trying to ascribe power to himself. It was coming out of many different factors that he was ascribing power to himself as the chief of the church at that time. Uh, he was, there were a couple of ecumenical councils that looked directly to the Pope to authenticate them. Um, there was uh, one uh, Pope by the name of Leo who wrote a particular tome, um, and that tome became very uh, it was uh, directly against the claims of Nestorius at the time. Um, and so whenever the Council of Chalcedon met, they looked to this tome <laughs> specifically to, um, uh, to formulate uh, their, their formulation of 100% God, 100% man, this formulation of who Christ was um, as uh, the divine, the God-man. Um, and uh, so, of course, uh, that just kind of validated many of the Pope's ideas that, oh, they are looking to, to me to authenticate what the church teaches. They're looking to me and my formulations um, to, to, to say this is, this is what the church says. And uh, while this worked out in the beginning because there were many popes uh, in the beginning that really were uh, very doctrinally sound and were uh, uh, trying to, um, to really get at the heart of what the scriptures taught about Christ and who Christ was, um, this of course uh, became worse as the principle behind it, that is, that the Pope can say things and that is something that the Church should then look to because he is the Pope, um, that became an issue. When the Pope says that, God, that Christ is 100% God and 100% man, that's good, we should believe it, but we don't believe that because the Pope said it, and yet that's what Popes down the line are going to start thinking. They're going to look at some of these councils and say, well, you agree with those councils, but it was the Pope that authenticated them, and so there was kind of a... Uh, this creeping in that direction. Um, other reasons why, why the Pope begins to gain this kind of uh, power um, is really has to do more with politics and uh, the history of medieval Europe than anything else. Um, the, of course, we talked about last time about the ecumenical patriarchs, and there were six of them, if you include the Pope among them, um, at those, the, of those ma main big cities that had churches that were apostolic, that is, churches that... Uh, they claim to be started directly by the apostles. Um, and whenever 1054 rolls around, the five in the east broke with the pope in the west um, because the pope had started to claim more power than the other five had. Uh, now, the, the, the big reason for this is because um, we talked about the language distinction, right? In the Eastern Empire, uh, Greek was still the main spoken language. They still had access to many of the Greek fathers and many of the Greek philosophers and historians through the Greek language, whereas in Europe they only had access to them 
uh, scantily through uh, different Latin translations because Latin was the main language of uh, Europe. And even then, it was only the language of the learned. Latin, uh, at the common level, had broken itself down into many uh, more what were called vulgar tongues or common tongues uh, that we know uh, today to be uh, what would become English, German, French, uh, Italian, etc. Um, and so they didn't have access directly to a lot of these writings. So there was already distinctives going on. There was already a separation going on. Uh, but the main separation and the main thing that made the Pope kind of have to take charge as a main, not even just spiritual, but also political leader in Europe, um, was uh, the incursion of the Islamic Caliphate. Um, the medieval situation cannot be understood unless you understand just how serious the Islamic Caliphate was and how powerful and how aggressive it was. It really turned Europe into an isolated unit uh, for a very, very long time, and the medieval situation was forged uh, because of that. Um, so we talked a little bit about Islam uh, a while back when we had our class on Islam and how it started um, and how Muhammad was able to bring together many disparate Arabic tribes together under one banner. And because he was able to do so, um, these warring tribes put their skills and their fervor together and were able to go forward and make an empire uh, quicker, almost as quick as Alexander the Great was able to do, which is quite uh, a feat. Um, as they start going and, and just sweep through northern Africa uh, and go up north and uh, really even pose a, a threat uh, to Huns and people coming from the Mongolian side of things. And uh, as they encourage on the, uh, the eastern side of the, the Eastern Empire, uh, the Eastern Empire dwindles to basically no power at all. And as they come from the west and they go through northern Africa, they are able to get most, if not uh, most of the Iberian Peninsula, that is Spain and Portugal, are completely taken out um, by the Islamic Caliphate and turned into a grand empire uh, that lasts for quite a long time. And so now that you, if you are now in the West, if you are living in what we would call the early, early Middle Ages, um, close to what we might, we might call the dark times, uh, you no longer have access or um, trade access to anything outside of Europe. So Europe, now isolated from the Far East, is going to kind of wrap in on itself. It has lost the power and the glory of the Western Empire, which has fallen to the barbarians as they were warring with each other. Um, and now everything is kind of just broken apart. Uh, if we could think of, uh, especially right after the Western Empire falls and as the Islamic Caliphate is closing in, uh, that might be the closest thing to what these people would have known as an apocalypse. Everything is crumbling apart. Cities are being abandoned. Uh, many, many people have died to... Uh, not to the black plague per se yet, but many different uh, diseases and whatnot. And so uh, there was, as the churches that had been started and had been spread at that time, there really needed to be some kind of unit to unify them. And that's actually how the Pope uh, was able to gain a lot of the power. It was almost by necessity. Um, the, the bishops being uh, head over different priests in different parishes, uh, kind of, they it, it, by necessity, them been looking forward to or looking up the chain to the Pope who was sending them out. Uh, this became uh, the unit by which the uh, the people uh, had some kind of unifying spirit. There was a church uh, almost everywhere that could be tied back to a bishop who could tie it back to the Pope, and so there was a a system by which he could bring everyone together. He could uh, kind of um, help the people uh, rise out of the rebel, as it were. And uh, so without uh, the Pope, there's, there's an argument that that couldn't have, uh, have happened the way that it did. Um, otherwise, uh, many of the, the kings probably would have turned pagan. And, and there's, there's, I mean, the Catholics would like to, to say that without it, the Europe would not have been Christian. Um, but uh, so we should, before we kind of jump on the bandwagon and say, well, the Pope is evil, the Pope is bad, all of these things. At that time, there's, there's an argument to be made for the fact that this was, this was being forged out of necessity. Um, as Europe is now isolated from the rest of the outside world um, as the medieval situation uh, is being forged. Um, of course, the, the kind of the things that uh, once the, the Pope began to make more claims for himself and very quickly did, so the papal, what was known as the papal states were states that the Pope had direct political uh, control over. And these were formed very, very early, as early as when Charlemagne was around. Um, and lasted uh, very, very late um, into perhaps the 16 or 1700s. The Pope had uh, 
has political control as well as spiritual control over the church. Um, and to even assert further his political control, um, one has to, of course, look to Charlemagne. Charlemagne was a Frankish king um, who, at that time, the Franks and many of the other barbarian nations are still warring among themselves. And uh, it was, um, but, but Charlemagne proved to be the better of all of them, and he was able to conquer uh, much of all of France, much of all of Germany, and even push the Islamic horde back into, um, into Spain quite a bit. Um, and this is, uh, of course, a, a, a great tale you can read in the Song of Roland, which talks about a battle that Charlemagne had with um, the, the Muslims. Um, and uh, so, so Charlemagne, uh, being as powerful as he was and wanting to educate this new empire and wanting to uh, Christianize this new empire, the Pope really liked him. And the Pope may have liked him really even more uh, whenever there was another barbarian tribe by the name of the Lombards who wanted to come and invade the Papal States and the Pope got kind of scared, but then Charlemagne said, don't worry, I'll take out the Lombards for you, and he did just that. So, of course, the next Christmas day, um, the Pope, the Pope uh, crowns, uh, surprisingly, well, he invites Charlemagne down to Rome. Charlemagne comes to the, the, uh, the Christ Mass, as it is called, or we would call Christmas, um, and as he is worshiping, the Pope comes with a great crown and he places it upon the head of Charlemagne, thus forging what we would know later in the medieval period as this, this dispute between the Pope and the emperors of what is now called the Holy Roman Empire, because who actually has more control? Is the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire emperor because the Pope crowned him to be? Or was he the emperor because he had conquered all of these things and he had political control and that was by his own right and, uh, and might? Uh, so this became a dispute uh, between Charlemagne and his descendants and the pope and his uh, quote-unquote descendants as more and more popes uh, uh, take his place. Um, and it, uh, it became quite a dispute. There was a, um, the many times where the pope would assert things and say, uh, you king of this nation or you king of that nation, you can't do that. If you do that, I will excommunicate you. He would proceed to excommunicate said king. Said king would proceed to then take his army and march upon Rome, in which case the pope would say, oh, wait a second, you're not really excommunicated. I changed my mind. <laughs> and there would be a back and forth. Unfortunately, of course, the pope also had his own armies and his own men that he could levy and he could raise um, as well though the Papal States never rose uh, to a level that they could challenge a, a nation like France or, a, or the Holy Roman Empire or anything like that. Um, but, uh, so this became quite, quite an issue you can imagine that uh, really a, a heart, at the heart of much of what would become problematic tradition in the Roman Catholic Church is going to stem from the fact that the Pope um, has so much direct control over the Church and has a lot of direct political power as well. Um, and indirect political power in the forms of uh, trying to use the spiritual power to push uh, different political players in the medieval landscape. Um, this uh, kind of led, of course, to um, there, were, there became a, a huge corrupt uh, kind of system in which a pope could be elected to be pope. Um, so the, the way that a pope is elected to be pope goes through uh, what is known as the uh, cardinals, um, and the cardinals that make up what is called a college that will then decide amongst themselves who is going to be uh, the next pope. Um, and uh, it became very common, especially once you get into the 1400s, uh, that many rich families, um, and one of those uh, being the Medici, um, had a lot of money as being these bankers uh, in the state of Florence, this, the independent city state of Florence that have been independent for a very, very long time. They had almost direct and total control of the city-state of Florence that claimed to be a republic, um, be but because the Medici had so much power and money and influence, they were able to, to rule that city-state uh, on their own. And just as they did in Florence, they could also use their power and their money in Rome, and of course they did, um, and influenced and bought off uh, many of the elections that would make the next man pope. Um, so much so that we know that there were many degenerates that were made pope just because they were bought off by the Medici and were the Medici's puppets. Eventually, the Medici even got their own son uh, to be a uh, pope. It's actually one of the Medici that was actually the pope that excommunicated Martin Luther at the time. So by the time Luther is dealing with the Roman Catholic Church and how corrupt it had become, he is, he is fighting a pope who has literally been installed because he is the Medici. <laughs> 
um, and we have uh, uh, just just this just goes to show you how corrupt things have become. Um, that corruption led to probably what is the most distinctive at, or the first distinctive break between those that called themselves reformers and those that were following the Pope in Rome, um, and that uh, the, the kind of spark that kind of set this whole thing off um, was the fact that the Pope was he, he was building up Rome and what we now know as the Vatican City um, to be this very uh, kind of uh, astounding, artful kind of wonder to the world as he's building things like the Sistine Chapel. And he wants, and, and in order to build all of these structures, uh, you need a great deal of money. And so the Pope, um, of course, at that time, the way that the Pope is getting money is that states are actually required by law to tithe their taxes to the Pope. So he's getting money through this, but even that's uh, not becoming enough. And of course, uh, the Medici, of course, always like to twist the Pope's arm as they say, oh yeah, your tithe will come. We'll get your, your five-year tithe uh, in there, but we need to pull some out of it. And they would borrow against it and became this whole kind of weird banking kind of thing. Um, and uh, so the Pope decided there was a way in which you could raise revenue um, without uh, relying on political states to give their tithes up to the Pope, and that is through the sale of indulgence. And so this uh, became a, a huge thing. There was a, a, especially a man by the name of Tetzel, which is very famous at the time of the Reformation, who would go around um, and he would sell an indulgence, and this, this actually gets into two main doctrines that uh, are distinctive of the Roman Catholic Church as well. That is, one is the doctrine of purgatory, the idea that there are not two but three places a soul may go whenever it dies. It can go to heaven, it can go to hell, but it could also go to purgatory. And most all Christians will end up in purgatory when they die, um, and they must be purged of their sin as they, that's where the word purgatory comes from, as they ascend and get closer to heaven. And once that sin has finally been purged and, and done away with, they, are in, they can enter into the heavenly places. Well, the indulgence was an idea uh, that gets behind another doctrinal error that they commit, and that is that the Pope and the church by extension has direct access to a treasury of grace. This is that all of those, those Christians that don't go to purgatory, that go straight to heaven, Essentially, they've done enough good works to get them into heaven. They've purged their sin enough that their works are now over and above, and now uh, their works are going into some kind of treasure chest that the church has direct access to and can dispense to people uh, through the Mass and through sacraments and through different things. Um, and so especially people like Mary, who they would claim to be sinless, that means every single one of her works is, is now in that treasury of merit. So just accumulating higher and higher and higher as more saints uh, go on to be with the Lord. Um, and now the church can just dispense with this as if it's some kind of bank that they can just give out checks for. Um, and so an indulgence was one of those checks. And so you could, uh, essentially, you could pay the church something and then they would give you the indulgence. They'd say, uh, this will buy a year off of your uncle's time in purgatory. You know he died the other year and he's in purgatory. Why don't you get a year off of his sentence. Um, and so it was this idea that you could uh, do this, and of course it turned into um, uh, it's a really corrupt system, even that you could do it for yourself, that you could say, oh, you could buy yourself a few years off of purgatory. You could buy yourself off of a sin that you committed, and now you, are, you have done away with that sin. Um, which, of course, there's a, a very famous, uh, uh, maybe uh, not true, uh, but a, a, a maybe a legendary kind of story about a, um, a man who was uh, a confessor who was selling indulgences and he stops into an inn uh, on his way back to Rome and he is, he is sitting there eating his food and, and a traveler comes up and he says, um, he says, Father, uh, how much money do I have to spend uh, to, to do away with a sin that I'm about to commit? Um, and um, the, the confessor says, uh, well, uh, this is how much money you would have to pay for that, and then that's, you, that sin will be forgiven. So the man pays him uh, a lot of money, and then he goes on his way, and the confessor then gets on his train, and he's taking all of his money that he's gotten from all of these indulgences he sold back to Rome. And on the, as he's on the way back, he gets ambushed. And as he's being surrounded by all of these, uh, these highwaymen, and he's, uh, he's being arrested by them, and, and they're taking the money away, uh, the leader of the highwaymen uh, turned out to be the guy that said, uh, yeah, this is the sin that I was planning on committing. Thank you so much. <laughs> and he went on his way. Um, 
And so, um, just a funny, funny story. I don't know if it's it's true or if it's something that the reformers like to tell, but uh, uh, it. it Within their system, logically, you, they would have to ascend. Like, it, I mean, Catholics would have to ascend. That's that's what that they were they were preaching. If you could really, if the church is that all powerful, they can just dispense grace willy nilly to whoever they want for a, a buck, really. Um, then, then sure, why why not? Right? Um, this this kind of story could have happened. Um, and so, uh, such corruption uh, really kind of hit at the heart of what the Reformation was all about. Right. People were seeing uh, that church was becoming corrupt, that many people were suffering because of it. Um, and so, um, of course, it wasn't, wasn't as if, though, that Martin Luther was the first or the only person to see this um, in 1517. Uh, before that, we have very famous examples of would-be reformers uh, in the likes of Jan Hus um, over what we now know as the Czech Republic, um, and John Wycliffe, or John Wycliffe, um, and he was over in Britain. Uh, over in Oxford. Um, John Wycliffe was a professor over in Oxford, and he actually made an English translation of the Bible. Um, and uh, he uh, taught against many of these doctrines in the Roman Catholic Church um, and was very, very famous for doing so. He actually wasn't uh, uh, martyred or anything like that. He died, but then he was then excommunicated posthumously, um, and they exhumed his body and burned it because they thought that this would mean somehow that this would affect his spiritual afterlife. Um, and, uh, but because, especially because of his grave sin that he committed, which is another distinctive of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, of translating the Bible and of presuming that one could learn the true doctrines that the scripture teaches through this translation that he had. Um, because that would then get back to uh, demeaning the power of the church as it had to interpret the scriptures and rightly put the right doctrines out for the people to believe. Um, and so, uh, so John Wycliffe was, was one of those. And John Huss, of course, or, or Jan Huss, um, was, uh, he, he, went even, he went even further, and there was, uh, through his teachings against the Roman Catholic Church, um, he got himself killed. Um, he was preaching against them, the Roman, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, which had control over Germany and the Czech Republic, or what was known as Bohemia at the time. Um, he said, Jan, you make some good points. Why don't you meet us here in this one location, and we'll, uh, we'll talk it out. Um, since I'm the political power here, the Pope's not the political power here, so uh, it's, it's all going to be good. So he go, makes his way down, and he calls up the, the Pope in Rome, and he says, why don't you send your legate, and we'll have a debate here, and I'll basically be the moderator. It'll all be great, right? Well, the Catholics get there first, and they're like, you're not a real emperor if you don't kill him as soon as you get here. Um, and so he, uh, he said, really? He's like, you're not going to have a debate with this guy? And the, the, the papal legate said, uh, you know, we're not going to have a debate, and the Pope's going to excommunicate you if you don't. And... Uh, yeah, you're not you're not really a Christian if you're not going to kill him. Um, so as soon as Jan Hus gets into town, he's arrested and they burn him at the stake, um, which uh, turns into a really uh, really bad political situation for the Holy Roman Emperor because there were many uh, what are known as Hussites in Bohemia in the Czech Republic area uh, that were following after him and loved his teachings, and there were political uprisings for uh, many years to come uh, that the Holy Roman Emperor had to deal with. Um, they were not happy uh, with what they saw as deceit um, and underhandedness by the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, so, uh, so by the time we get to Luther, uh, both John Wycliffe and his uh, group of followers in Oxford and the Hussites over in Bohemia, um, there's already turmoil, right? It's not as if Martin Luther shows up on the scene and everyone's like, oh yeah, the Roman Catholic Church probably isn't the best system in the world. Um, they, they understood that the corruption was inherent, and there was already a great debate over how to deal with it. Um, there were many people that were saying, what we really need to do is do what the Eastern Orthodox Church does. We need to get back to councils and, and get away from, from the Pope. But the system itself, we, we don't want to just do away with the system itself. We just need to get councils on board, uh, which, of course, uh, uh, became a, a big thing because there was a time in history when there were three popes all at once. Uh, this was uh, known as the Avignon Papacy um, because uh, one, one pope essentially, uh, there, was a, there was a debate over how an election happened and said, no, he's not really legitimately the pope. So there was another election 
held, and then there were two popes, and then they both excommunicated each other. And so then the, 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 there was a council met, and they said, no, neither one's the pope. We're going to elect this guy as, as the interim pope, and he's going to uh, decide which of these two is the real pope. And then once he was, then he excommunicated both of them, and then everyone was excommunicated, and the council didn't know what to do because they didn't. So it became this whole, this whole deal. And so it, once that happened, you have many people um, in, the, in Europe, in medieval or later medieval Europe, uh, advocating for conciliarism. No, we need to get back to councils. We don't need to have the popes having the final word. It's the councils that have the final word. Um, some people were, were saying, wait, but it was a council that elected the third pope anyway, so is it really a council that's going to fix this problem anyway? Um, and so you, you, there, was, there was many debates back and forth in academia at that time, uh, which uh, Erasmus was a big part of. If you, uh, Erasmus, which was a contemporary of Luther, um, he did not want to uh, do away with the Roman Catholic uh, Church, uh, but he did recognize much of the corruption in it and did uh, write against it. Um, and so whenever Luther, and you know, there's a, a very famous debate between Erasmus and Luther um, uh, that, uh, that happened during the Reformation, but uh, Erasmus was not fighting for, he wasn't fighting and saying that the, the, the Pope is just somehow not corrupt or the, the system is not corrupt. He, he acknowledged and recognized that. Um, so. Um, this, uh, these ideas were, were very prevalent already. Once we get, of course, to the Reformation, this is when the Roman Catholic dogma is really forged and begins to be solidified, though, um, because, of course, there is the Reformation, and then there is what is known as the Counter-Reformation. That is, that the Roman Catholic Church uh, met at what is known as the Council of Trent, and they began to affirm all the doctrines that were being denied by the reformers, right? So they said, you cannot be a true Roman Catholic unless you deny salvation by faith alone, right? You cannot be a true Roman Catholic unless you deny that truth comes from the scriptures alone. You have to, all of these things that we know as the solos, which are right here, unless you deny all of these, you're not a real true Roman Catholic. Um, and so the Council of Trent um, is where first, actually, uh, for, for, for anyone's uh, historical amusement, was where the Apocrypha is first solidified as scripture by the Roman Catholic Church. It had been being used by different Roman Catholic churches at the time as scripture, but some would deny that it was scripture, um, especially uh, the, uh, if you look even back further to, the, to St. Jerome, who actually translated the Vulgate, which was the standard uh, Bible used by the Catholic Church. Um, even though it had the Apocrypha in it, um, he wrote extensively within that translation in the notes that no, these are not in fact scripture, um, that only those uh, books that are part of the original Hebrew Bible are part of the Old Testament, not what the Septuagint then added later whenever they made the Greek translation. Um, and so uh, that, that debate kind of continued and to, to uh, fizzle under the surface until the reformers like Luther and Calvin were saying, no, only uh, these books that are in the original Hebrew Old Testament are the, the Old Testament. And then the Catholic Church says, well, you can't believe that if you want to be a good Roman Catholic. And so it became a, the, the, the division kind of solidified because of that. Um, so uh, it, that's a, one, one point always to, to bring up uh, with the Roman Catholics. They're saying, no, you, how do we know that the Bible is correct? We have the true Bible here with the Apocrypha. They didn't say, oh, well, that wasn't really solidified until Trent, which is actually after the Reformation. Um, and so there was a, um, that debate going on. Um, the Counter-Reformation, of course, brought with it um, what uh, is known as the Jesuits, which is a, a, a monastic order. There were many different monastic orders at the time. Um, monasticism was very popular in uh, the Roman Catholic Church, especially given that all those that were in the clergy had to be monastics to certain extents. Uh, you couldn't be married and be uh, a priest or um, a bishop in the Roman Catholic Church. And so many different monastic orders crept up, and one of them was uh, the Jesuits. And while they are mostly known now for their missionary work, um, at that time they were known um, because of their very uh, hard-headed uh, anti-reformer rhetoric. They, it was many of the, uh, the early reformers, many of their big debate partners were Jesuits who were very scholarly and very learned and came up with many arguments to try to combat the reformers' arguments for sola fide or sola scriptura or any of those things. 
Um, and so uh, many, many distinctive doctrines came out of the Jesuit uh, kind of uprising, intellectual uprising against uh, the reformers. The, uh, one can, of course, then even go further, and as, as, as the Re Reformation kind of begins to settle, and it looks like we, we're seeing then uh, what Protestantism is going to look like, it's going to be here for the long haul, the two will begin to even just grow further and further apart. Uh, many of the doctrines in the Roman Catholic Church now that we take for granted are actually quite new as far as them being forged into dogma. Uh, we'll talk about what dogma means next time. But uh, uh, So when we think of um, the fact that Mary uh, was uh, immaculately uh, conceived, um, that she was born sinless, without original sin, um, this is a, a doctrine that was only in the 19th century uh, declared as dogma in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and the idea of papal infallibility, that is, the Pope can speak uh, from the chair, which it means ex cathedra, that is just this idea that when he's speaking on doctrinal matters in a doctrinal matters in an official capacity, that whatever he says is infallible, it is just like the scriptures are speaking to that thing. Um, this was really as dogma uh, put in the 19th century as well. Um, now, of course, that does not to say that papal claims were not as very bad during the 15 and 1600s, during the Reformation, um, and yet uh, as a dogma, the, the ex cathedra doctrine was not put into dogma until the 19th century. Um, and so we just see then, of course, that the Catholic Church in the, is just, uh, just digging in its heels more and more and more as the centuries progress. Um, and once we even, the, the problem, of course, with all of this, and this, is, this gets uh, very complicated uh, for our study in the Doctrine of Distinctives, is once you hit the 20th century, um, the game just changes entirely. Um, the Catholic Church today is not the Catholic Church of the early 20th century, which was not even the, church, the Catholic Church of the 19th century. Um, the 20th century brought with it many different uh, religious uh, ideas, um, in the early 20th century, we see Pentecostalism growing. Pentecostalism was not uh, just tied to a particular denomination, though, of course, there were many denominations at the time that were forged, like the Assemblies of God, that were particularly <laughs> Pentecostal. But the Pentecostal movement uh, spread into many different churches, including the Catholic Church. And so you will see many Catholic churches that will, uh, uh, will have more Pentecostally kind of gifts of the spirit ideas uh, within them. Um, and so that, that kind of makes their, their variations within the Catholic Church. Um, then, of course, you have the social justice or social gospel issue that was cropping up at the early part of the 20th century. Um, there was a, a lot of this came from the fact that the Catholic Church was very prevalent in South America. And there were many socialist kind of leaders that were le trying to form revolutions in different parts of South America and Latin America. Um, and so the Catholic Church kind of grabbed hold of this, and uh, there were many Catholic churches at the time that were buying into what is known as liberation theology. That is, that Christ really has come to liberate the slaves from their masters. And we will, uh, up, uh, uh, it was basically just kind of a Marxist idea, right? Marxism being uh, interloped with, uh, with the Catholic Church and Catholic doctrine. Um, and this became uh, very popular, although there were attempts to kind of quell it uh, at the beginning of the 20th century as the Pope tried to get everyone to sign a document uh, called the Anti-Modernist uh, kind of signature where they would all sign and say, if you're a part of the Catholic Church in any kind of teaching capacity, you cannot believe liberation theology, you cannot believe modernism, all of these things, though that did little to quell it because as we get further and further down the line, once you get to what is known as Vatican II, which is one of the latest councils, I believe it is the latest council in the Catholic Church, um, social, the social gospel, liberation theology, all of these things are already seeping into the Catholic Church. They lax on many of their hardline dogma. Much of what we would consider, do or what was considered dogma up until that point is kind of just dropped. So now at this point, they will not necessarily teach that you have to be in the Catholic Church to be saved. Or, um, or they will not speak Latin in their masses anymore. Um, or they will say it's good for their people to read the scriptures on their own. Um, things that they would have never have taught until the Vatican, the Second Vatican Council. Um, and it's a, and now the whole thing is just kind of thrown the Catholic Church uh, really into a big 
mess. You will find Catholics that are very old school Catholics that will say the same type of things that they would have said in 19th century. And then you'll find Catholics that are very liberal and very just almost complete communists in what they believe um, and try to marry it to, uh, to Christian theology. And so uh, this becomes a real uh, uh, kind of dilemma if you're, if you're wanting to come up and talk to a Catholic and wanting to, to get them to repent of uh, the error in that church um, and to see uh, the light of what Scripture is saying. Uh, you can't just hit the traditional points that the reformers hit, right? Uh, many of these things uh, are not universally accepted by all Catholics. Sometimes they are by different people, and sometimes they aren't. Um, and so, of course, which all of this gets back to, um, it gets really at the heart of one issue, which is that the Roman Catholic Church is not somehow, quote-unquote, Catholic, despite its name. Catholic means universal, means unified that their claim has been for hundreds of years. The Protestant church is terrible because we're all divided. We don't have one head of the church. We don't have unification and we're not Catholic. We, they say, no, we in Rome, we are the Catholic church. And yet, despite all their claims, Catholicity is really the furthest thing from what the Catholic church is today, as there are just far too many opinions on, on all this doctrine on all these uh, these ways to practice their faith, um, it's not it's not unified anymore. He talked about how the Eastern Orthodox Church isn't unified necessarily. The Eastern Orthodox Church is much more unified than the Catholic Church is. Um, the Catholic Church uh, really has fallen far, and especially if you get to any Catholic university, you'll see the debates raging over how to interpret different people like Thomas Aquinas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's uh, just fallen very far from its. Uh, once point of, of great power and political uh, establishment. Um, so that is a whirlwind tour of the Catholic Church essentially from 1054 to now. Um, are there any No, I thought that was a great summary. Mm. That, that's exciting. Thank you. <laughs> I, I love the rise of, of, of Charlemagne and mm -hmm. Europe and Europe because it's still echoed today. Mm -hmm. You understand that history, you understand where we are mm -hmm. as a culture today. Oh, for sure. You really don't need to preserve our Western civilization. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you talk about, because I think when the second biggest problem with the Catholic Church, you had adults of the adultery. Mm -hmm. the, the fathers and the widows that were made to feel so guilty about their loved ones and their priests. Mm -hmm. The parents themselves were lost. Oh, yeah. Here and now. Mm -hmm. But also the, the noetic effect. Because mm -hmm. part of the problem with the Catholic Church was that while it's been corrupt a lot of things, it doesn't corrupt man's mind. Mm -hmm. And Aquinas used Plato's philosophy to, to demonstrate through logic the incorruptibility of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And he took away that Christ like humility because now man can, in his own mind, be like God. Right. So there's, there's really, a, it's almost like this is near us. Right. Can you, can you talk about the noetic effect? Yeah, so, so that's a, a, the noetic effect of sin, which is a, a, a Greek term to, to talk about the intellectual uh, effect of sin. That, that sin doesn't merely corrupt uh, your, your moral or your ethic. Um, it corrupts your mind and how you perceive the world and how you reason. Um, really, this really just gets at uh, the, the Calvinist doctrine of total depravity, that sin affects every part of the man. Uh, it doesn't just affect one part isolated from another. Um, and the, uh, the famous uh, theologian, Thomas Aquinas, uh, talked a lot about natural theology and natural uh, reason. He was very enamored with uh, Aristotle. Uh, brought, he was really brought Aristotle into Latin, and so he took Aristotle and Plato, and, and, and really uh, we can see Aristotelian and Platonic thought all over his writings. Um, and so, because of, of what he wrote, many Catholics uh, have taken that uh, to, to its extreme as they look at uh, reason, and reason is now something that, so in, 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 in Thomas's kind of idea of apologetics, the way that someone gets from being an unbeliever to a believer, what you have to do is you first work with them in their reason, which can get them to God, right? That their reason through them observing natural revelation, that that is not corrupted by sin, um, and that 
while their ethic may be corrupted by sin. And so you have to show them, uh, and he uses Aristotle's proofs about the unmoved mover to show them there is a God, there must be a God, and here's why, look at this and look at this, and you have to accept intellectually that, that, that there is a God here. And then once you're using natural revelation to get there, then once they say, okay, yes, I understand, there is a God, then you can go the other step and say, and the God of the scriptures through special revelation, he is that God, and you need to accept this now that you've accepted that there is a God. Um, yes, what that really ends up denying, like you said, is the fact that sin has an effect on the mind and that men have reasoned out um, to many different conclusions about the world, about what it is, about who man is, and about who that God is. So even if you get them to that there is a God, that isn't really quote-unquote progress. If they believe that God is Allah, they're still going to hell. If they believe that, that God is the Buddha, um, they're still going to hell. That, there's no, you haven't actually gotten anywhere, and that's also assuming uh, that, they're, that people are starting at the atheistic position to begin with. Uh, they could be starting in a myriad of different positions, and what we need to do, of course, is to take uh, people's worldview as a whole um, and see that if they have a non-Christian worldview, that they will, by necessity of the fact, be holding to positions that they cannot consistently justify or prove within that position. If they are an atheist and they are saying that there is absolute morality, they can't prove that fact. And so you have to show them that the consistency of their worldview breaks down as a whole, that their entire intellectual system is sinful, that really the reason why that they're, they're, they're believing this is because they don't want to buy that there is a self-contained triune God who is at the back of everything, who has created everything, and you cannot actually believe. There are things that you cannot believe to be true that you actually do believe to be true unless you come over here and you say, and the system that is created, that intellectual system about how we view the world, that worldview that is created by the belief in the self-contained triune God of the scriptures, that is where your belief in absolute morality or all of these different beliefs that you might have can truly be justified. And so it is, that is, uh, in a nutshell, the, the, to talk, I mean, there are so many different opinions on what Aquinas was writing. He wrote a lot. Um, but um, the, the entirety of the Catholic Church um, has, whatever their interpretation of Thomas Aquinas might be, um, and even within the Catholic Church, there are many interpretations of him, you are required to believe what Aquinas believes to be part of the Catholic Church. Um, and so he has, through Aristotle and Plato, which of course are two pagan thinkers, um, though he was not the only one to, to let them into the Christian system, uh, he based it a lot of his metaphysics and ethics um, and uh, epistemology on those two pagan thinkers. Or, yeah.